Thank you so much. I'm going to start out on mute. But I uh, appreciate everyone joining us here today. We um, appreciate the opportunity. We're excited to talk with Cliff Holcamp from Cultivate Capital today and learn a little bit more about their funds, sort of the investment criteria and, um, and <clears throat> sort of where they stand in their life cycle of the fund. And appreciate Cliff being here. Good to be here. And um, if, if there are any questions you know, that pop up, please feel free to, um, to express those via the chat feature and, um, or otherwise you know, raise your hand. So we'll be sure to address those as we go. I want this to be sort of an, an interactive sort of program where Cliff, you know, of course, feel free to elaborate on any, on any of these questions and we'll kind of see where the chat goes and, and hope it's an interesting and productive one for everybody. Sounds great. Well, again, it's um, Cliff Holcamp, and um, pleasure to sort of introduce you here and um, and go through this fireside chat with you. But I guess just sort of you know big picture on on your fund. Um, you know, what size is the fund, and, and how far are you into the life cycle? You know, what are your your typical sort of check sizes that you guys might write? And you know, if you have a, a two minute sort of elevator pitch, as we call them, would love to hear those to get started. Sure, I guess just taking a step back, uh, Cultivation Capital was founded in 2012. Um, we uh, actually operate in four different uh, industry verticals. Uh, one is software tech, which is uh, primarily B2B SaaS, but sometimes we uh, vary from that business model and a lot of our FinTech holdings. Uh, we also have a line in the life sciences uh, which currently is focused very specifically on clinically validated digital health. We also have a line of uh, uh, in the area of ag tech, agriculture technology, and we actually maintain another brand in ag tech called the Yield Lab. So if you've heard of the Yield Lab, that's actually part of Cultivation Capital. And then uh, lastly, we uh, uh, just got into the geospatial industry uh, with Cultivation Capital Geospatial and uh, focused uh, on companies that are um, specifically in the location services uh, area, could have things to do with supply chain logistics, precision ag, um, national defense, satellite. Um, that's kind of cross industry, but, but focus on location services. So uh, we do have a, a number of strategies that we operate in. Personally, my focus is on the software tech, but I'm certainly very close to my colleagues in the other lines as well. You're on mute. So that, that's an interesting sort of array of, of industries that you guys are looking at. And obviously you're, you have a sort of a focal point which is consistent with the folks in, in this audience. If you had to say there is some type of a, a key metric that you guys look at, you know, whether it be the overall firm or you know, your specific space, what would you say that is? Well, across the firm, we have a thesis of looking for opportunities in uh, undercapitalized markets. So we do not um, uh, really deal hunt in Silicon Valley, don't do a lot in New York and Boston. Um, our focus is the rest of the country. So Midwest, Southeast, um, that's our bread and butter. So we are uh, um, very focused on, on, on sort of the, uh, uh, the areas of the country that um, are sometimes overlooked by the large uh, coastal firms. Uh, I think the other thing that, uh, that we would look for uh, across the entire firm is high growth, obviously. Um, you know, having growth rates that support the venture capital business model. I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, forget that, that we also have investors and have to provide uh, returns to the people that invested in us and as a result, for our business model to work, we need to invest in companies that have very high growth. So we look for traction. Um, we look for evidence that, uh, that the company has been growing at a very fast clip and that they've developed a, a, a marketing and sales engine that's scalable. And I'd say that's uh, generally true you know, across the strategies. And is there any, you know, we we oftentimes look at the sort of late relationship between entrepreneurs and you know, venture capital firms. And you know, there's 
obviously a number of sort of stages of that relationship, sort of getting to know each other and, and you know, looking at a potential investment and then actually closing an investment and then sort of the, the go forward you know, process. And obviously you, you, know, you made a great note there that sometimes you know, entrepreneurs might not take into account that VC funds and, and you know, all, all sorts of funds have to go back to, to their LPs. Is there one or two sort of do's and don'ts that, that you might see in the way of, of how yeah, an entrepreneur yeah. so, would address well, the scenario? No, I, I don't. Um, well, I, I think there's a lot of do's and don'ts. I, I think when, when you're looking at um, the earlier stages of starting your company, there definitely are some easy pitfalls um, uh, to be careful to avoid. Um, I think one of the ones that uh, I'm seeing recently is a lot of companies are getting overcapitalized. They're raising more capital than they need. Uh, they're diluting them. The founders are diluting themselves and not necessarily able to um, really leverage all the capital they're raising. And so, you know, that obviously can be, you know, a problem both for the entrepreneur and for their early stage, you know, earlier seed stage investors. So that's something that I'd be, you know, looking out for. That's it's it's uh, a sort of a common issue that's happening in the the current climate. Um, we see that all the time. We have, I I refer to it as cap table management. And, um, you, know, you have a, a dense cap table of different structures that does that becomes problematic for you know, any type of investor and. There are so many cap table management issues that come up. I, I'd say, you know, another one that we see in early stage, you know, seed stage companies is sometimes entrepreneurs will strike um, non-conventional deals with angel investors, and that can come back to haunt them in later years. Um, they should get some legal advice from someone like MMM who understands what normal looks like. And sometimes those unconventional deals can uh, leave a company uh, almost uninvestable or at least very unattractive for investment for later stage uh, investors. You gotta remember as your company progresses, investors are more and more professional, have more and more options and have higher and higher expectations. And so um, sometimes the earlier stage, you know, friends and family type investors don't really understand the cultural norms and sometimes ask for terms or for rights or privileges that aren't standard. And um, it's important to explain to those early stage uh, angel investors why that's not in their own best interest. Well, it might sound like a good thing, for example, to have a permanent board seat or undilutable capital investment or royalties. You know, these are all the types of things that would uh, render a, uh, a company pretty uninvestable by later stage entrepreneurs. And, and hey, that angel investor doesn't want to hinder the company, otherwise they wouldn't have invested in it, right? They just don't understand that those terms uh, are, are not considered standard and, and, and would be considered penalizing to uh, future investors in the business. So getting uh, some uh, help so that you know what normal is and being able to educate those angel investors that are supporting you into you know, how they can best help the business and why that'll help themselves to not do strange or funky deals. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think the use of the word normal is, is so appropriate here. You know, kind of, it's the angel investors. They can have a number of different sort of. You know, who is that angel investor? Why are they there? You know, it could be someone in the industry who also wants a you know, a related party deal, and they're so the businesses are you know doing work with each other, and that becomes you know problematic and you know, inevitably. And, uh, so those are you know. Those are that would hit the you know number of the issues that we typically see as you know reoccurring as well. And the other, you know, you, of course, you mentioned you being in the software tech space yourself and your your fund being you know, having a, a broader sort of spectrum. Um, and the folks on, on this line, you know, ATDC, of the you know, typically kind of software technology enabled services type companies. And you know, do you run into many IP issues at the at the sort of VC stage, or is that something that, you know, it's kind of worked on as part of the growth process? Um, well, I, the answer is yes. We see a, a number of IP related issues. Um, I, I, it, it, there's a broad spectrum, right? So um, uh, sometimes uh, 
there are issues where an entrepreneur doesn't realize they're infringing someone else's IP. Um, I think most founders are very focused on protecting what they're creating, but they're not necessarily cognizant of what they might be infringing upon that somebody else created, may not realize that. So that can be an issue. Um, I also, uh, I, I think that the value of, of IP depends. In some cases, a patent can be very valuable. In other cases, it's actually not that valuable. You might get protection anyway, but it may not have the um, impact on valuation of the business that you might have thought. So it depends on the practical use of that IP, um, your practical ability to enforce that IP. Um, and so it, there's, there's a lot of subtleties with regard to IP that, that um, uh, aren't so simple. And so those matter. I also think that one of the um, most underutilized forms of IP that we see is trade secret. And that, that companies should be doing a lot more to identify um, proprietary processes, proprietary information, and to um, formally provide trade secret protection. A, tr a good, well-held trade secret can be more valuable than a patent, particularly in, tech, in, in, in IT where things are easily worked around or easily imitated using a different method, uh, where a, a trade secret could actually um, not educate the public on how it works and, yeah. and give you that same protection. And I would also add that uh, um, going through the formality of protecting your trade secrets also cues to other people who uh, investors and potential acquirers of the business, what's important. So it, 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 it puts a big highlighter across what are the most important parts of your business and why it's valuable. And when you've taken the effort to protect those proprietary elements of your business, you're indicating and cueing to others that it's a value. And why would someone else believe it's a value if you don't treat it like it's a value? And so I think from a um, uh, uh, enterprise marketing perspective of, of, of positioning the business to have the highest perceived value from a business development perspective, M&A perspective, utilizing a trade secret can be a, a very useful tool. That's exactly right. And, you know, we, <clears throat> you'll see where you know, companies, if they you know, start talking to investors, if you have a you know, firm such as ours, just representing the company, and then, you know, you start having, you know, maybe one-off discussions, or maybe you're actually looking to raise money and you start this NDA process, you see from the very beginning, you know, Cliff has such a great point on the trade secrets that you know, we have, we specifically address trade secrets in each of the NDAs and kind of set it apart to show, you know, sort of the, the value and the, the sort of the, the magnitude of protecting those trade secrets. Whereas in, you, you make a, a great sort of comparison to intellectual property where, you know, a patent or some type of trademark might, regardless of what type of business it is, it might just not be integral to the business. It might, you know, the protection of certain IP might not be much of a consideration for an investor or buyer. And it may not practically be enforceable. Right. You can have all the IP claims in the world. If you don't have the budget to enforce it, uh, it may not matter for some time. Yeah. I think that's, that's such a great point. Well, kind of, um, you know, shifting a little bit and look, looking at, you know, sort of where we are in the times. And, you know, we oftentimes will ask, you know, the venture capital firms, these, these types of questions, you know, what are you seeing with respect to valuation? And, um, you know, in a, you know, a, an interesting time for us where there's a lot of activity in the, you know, M&A market in particular, you know, coming up on, on year end, there's a lot of drivers for that sort of, you know, cap, available capital, you know, perceived uh, capital, capital gains tax changes coming up and under the Biden administration, you know, kind of a number of, of other items. And there's also COVID-19. And um, so we're, we're just interested to see, you know, sort of generally speaking, you know, what are you seeing with, with valuations? Are, are they up, down, um, or, or neutral following COVID? You know, I think uh, valuations are generally up, but there's a big difference in how much up depending on the nature of the business. So one thing I'm seeing is not all business models have the same valuations as others. So recurring SaaS businesses get a premium. 
So I think that uh, I'll, I'll, sometimes every entrepreneur thinks that they uh, should have the same valuation multiples as recurring SaaS businesses with low churn, right? And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I think that it also matters. Um, it's a huge difference if you're perceived as being a market leader. And generally a market leader would be someone who is a pioneer in a new space and um, has a, a generally a reasonable expectation of, of controlling that market, i.e. 50% market share somewhere in that neighborhood. So um, there are lots of great companies that aren't market leaders and are gonna be extremely successful. And obviously it's a, only a handful that truly are pioneering a new industry segment and have a leadership position in that segment. But if you can establish that, I think you have that opportunity for those really big multiples. So one of the things I do when I'm coaching early stage entrepreneurs is, can you position yourself as a segment leader? You know, how do you think about the segment you're in? Um, is this an established segment? Is this a new segment? And you know, can you feasibly, uh, you have a shot at being a market leader in that segment? Because if you have a compelling case, you'll get a higher valuation than, than if you're not considered a market leader in a hot new segment. That, that's that's a, such a great point on, on market leaders as well. And I guess, you know, that was kind of your advice to, you know, we use the term coaching of, um, you know, entrepreneurs. It, and that's that's a, a key piece. It, you know, one question we had on our sort of list of discussion points is any other kind of, you know, your top one, top two kind of, um, you know, coaching advice that you would give entrepreneurs? Well, uh, some of the things that we see early on, um, uh, I, I'd say probably one of the, the most common, I, whether I call it an, an error or a risk, would be uh, the risk of whale hunting. And by whale hunting, that is when an entrepreneur focuses an extremely large percentage of their time pursuing one big deal, the great white whale, right? Uh, like Captain Ahab. And uh, the, the risk of doing that is that you spend all your time and resources chasing that big deal and you're obviously putting your eggs into one basket, right? However, even if you win that deal, you then will find yourself with another problem and that's revenue concentration because you're gonna find that you're gonna have a large percentage of your revenue coming from one client. And uh, investors don't like revenue concentration. Now, it might be good from a cash flow perspective and that's important and that should be taken into account but from an investor perspective, a concentrated revenue is not given a full valuation multiple. It's discounted significantly. Sometimes people will discount to almost zero. And so, because that can be lost, you know, in, in, with, with one client getting mad and saying, we're dropping the program. And so um, generally you don't want any one client being worth more than 20% of your revenue if you don't want that revenue discounted in your valuation. And so whale hunting, is this double-edged sword because A, it's very risky in the first place, but it's risky if you actually win it and you actually get that big client, it's risky. And so you gotta be, you gotta be careful in that. And I'd say you're better off steadily growing with a small number of, of um, medium and small clients than going for that one big one. Absolutely. And <clears throat> you know, as the sun, um, rains down on, on me here from, from our office in, in Buckhead, yeah, I, it, that sort of triggers my response as the legal advisor that we see so many scenarios where we're looking at, at you know, in the reps and warranties, preparing the purchase agreement, you know, a company where they really have, you know, a couple of key customers. And, you know, we, we're concerned about customer churn. We're concerned about the relationships with those customers. You know, that's obviously the first customer calls that a, you know, a buyer is going to make. And, uh, and to the extent that they you know, even if that relationship is still churning out money, still, um, you know, a highly profitable and successful relationship, you can, you know, there's a scenario where if it is any way, shape or form subject to, you know, a, a change, you know, if you have a competitor who could come in and, and service that one large client, or if you have, you know, a scenario where, the client is changing over, you know, kind of leadership and they might want to go in a, a different direction. You know, we, we look at that strongly and as our clients and with respect to, you know, what happens if that customer goes away? 
And you know, Cliff raised a, a great point that you know, that's taken into account, not just in the legal process, but also in the valuation process. Yeah, you know, it's such that sometimes you might discount it to where it's you know, not even you know, considered that valuable. You know, so, I also would say that investors prefer to see um, steady, stable revenue growth. And when you're out chasing big clients, you know, your revenue is choppy, right? You, you, you'll go flat and then jump up and flat and jump up. And um, any investor would rather see uh, a smoother, steadier rise, even if you get to ultimately the same point, right? It gives them more confidence. But it, it's, um, uh, it doesn't instill confidence when you have choppy uh, revenue growth. Um, and so, you know, I think in the early stages, don't be afraid to start with smaller clients, you know, uh, and you're also not making your mistakes on big clients. It's better to make your mistakes on small clients. And if you lose them, it won't be as catastrophic, but you're better off having a large number of small clients than a small number of large clients in, in just about every way. Yeah, that's such a great point. And the, the learning curve as well, you know, get, I iron out the wrinkles with the, with the smaller clients and then, you know, perfect the product as you're going for the, for these whales. Exactly. Um, well, great. We well, just wanted to, as we kind of segue into, you know, looking more at cultivation capitals, kind of, you know, what they're looking to write as far as checks go. Yeah. I, I want to remind everyone the, the chat function is open and uh, we'd, we'd love to see some questions in there and, um, you know, or you know, feel free to speak up and you know, just chime in and, and we'll, address the questions, but, but Cliff, you know, I wanted to sort of, again, make another make little segue and, and sort of look at, you know, the checks that you guys are writing, you know, is, I think, you know, you're broadly described anywhere from series C checks to series B. And uh, so we'd just love to hear a little bit more about sort of your profile. Yeah, so we do um, have different strategies uh, and we do invest at the seed stage. Um, typically our seed stage checks are smaller 250 to 500. Um, when it's a little bit, a little bit later, um, we also have a focus on early A, late seed. And uh, well, I should probably define by seed, it's usually companies that are around a half a million dollars, um, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Um, and then uh, we have a late seed or early A strategy where we're looking for companies that are sort of in the 800,000, uh, maybe up to 2 million range, probably with a million being the most common size that we look at. And, um, and, and uh, for those, uh, we usually write checks in the two to $3 million range. Um, we, uh, we do lead, um, we're very uh, uh, prolific as leads. We, uh, um, um, even in the seed stage, we will provide leads. That's extremely valuable to, to uh, startups. I know that lots of times they can get lots of soft circle, a lot of interested capital, but nobody's willing to lead, right? They don't have the resources to lead. So it's nice as our firm has the, enough scale and enough internal resources that we will lead even when we're writing small um, seed stage checks. We'll still do the work to provide the lead and to coordinate the legal and do all that. Um, and then obviously we lead 90% of the time in our A round fund. Uh, with uh, usually two to $3 million checks is sort of the, the, the typical range. Great. And I think we, uh, we read Bart's mind as he had asked if you, know, you guys invest in the seed stage. So the you know, answer to that is yes. And then he's asking sort of what is the form of investment? Yeah, you know, we're looking at safe, convertible, no equity. So the answer to that is this good question is it depends. Um, we want to be strategic, right? And we want to choose the um, um, method that is going to be the most advantageous to the entrepreneur. So as soon as we invest, we're your partner, right? And so we've got the best interests of the company immediately in mind. And I, I would say that I believe that safes and notes are probably overutilized in seed stage companies. Um, they're seen as easier, uh, which they are, and they're seen as a little less expensive legally, which they are. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't recognize that they're also um, disincenting to follow on investors. So a, when a follow on investor um, looks at an opportunity, they're going to the interference. When a follow on investor is looking at an opportunity, uh, if there's a lot of um, safes or convertible notes, 
those are going to be added to the post money value of the round that that investor is looking at. And it's going to actually dilute that new investor. And so new investors look negatively on companies that have too much money and safes and notes because it's going to mean that the deal is going to be more expensive, right? It's going to be dilutive to them. And so it's a big disincentive. And there's a point where you could have so many notes and safes or the size of them are so high that it could actually kill deals. It could make, it could make you completely untouchable from as far as follow on investor. So the, I, got this, I see in the chat the perfect follow-up question, and that is how much is too much? Well, it's, it, I can tell you how much is definitely okay. 10% is no big deal, right? No one's going to get worked up about you know, a, a dilution of 10%. 20% is probably okay, but you get beyond that, and I think it starts to become a disincentive. So think about it as marketing, right? Like you would with any other marketing initiative. When you're going to market, for follow-on capital, you want to make your company as attractive as possible. And having notes that are going to dilute that new investor is unattractive, right? Especially if you're successful, which I assume you're planning to be. If you're successful, then that note could be very dilutive because it could be capped at an amount that's very low compared to the next round. So the dilution would could be you know, far more than the amount of capital itself because the, um, con the conversion price is gonna be so much lower than that, that new investor. So I'll just give an example here to kind of clarify. So if somebody invested a, a, a million dollars at a, uh, in a note with a $5 million cap, right? That means that that investor uh, who's in that note is gonna pay no more than a $5 million valuation. But uh, let's say that you do take that million, you're super successful and you double the value of the company with that money. And in the next round, the company is worth $10 million, right? So however, you never converted that million dollar note. So when that new investor is looking at your company that's now worth $10 million, they know they're going to have to pay the dilution for that million dollars that you've already spent, which they don't love, you know, getting diluted by money that's already been spent, that's already been gone. Uh, plus, it's not going to dilute them by a million. It's actually going to dilute them by two million because now the value of the company is ten million instead of five million. So the effective dilution of that million is more like as if it were two million, twice as much, right? Because the valuation is half of what the new valuation is going to be in the next round. So you know, right off the top, that's diluting the round on a ten million post by twenty percent, by two million. So remember, it's not just the amount of money, it's also the fact that that amount could be capped at an amount that's lower than the next round. So I generally think as a rule of thumb, if, if you've got, if you've raised a, 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 an amount of money that's tangible, pay the extra legal and just make it real and, and go ahead and, and do a priced round and, and lock it in, don't create any disincentives, um, you know, it, it's going to be easier for you and in, in the long run. So I usually say, if in the in the pre A, if you're raising two million, definitely do a priced round. But even over a million, I would probably do a priced round. Uh, if it's under five hundred thousand, I would probably do it as a note or safe. But once you get over five hundred, I'd start thinking about doing a price round. Over a million, I'd be thinking really hard about doing a price round. But again, it depends on a lot of factors. Those are just sort of generalist statements. But just remember that when you take in those notes and those safes, that they're creating a disincentive for future investors. And that, that's a great lesson, Eric. We, we, we appreciate you asking that, that follow-up. And I think the follow-up, you know, listening to Cliff's response, hits a couple of key points that we talked about. You know, just broadly, cap table management. And then, you know, the second that kind of strikes me is, you know, especially pre-series type type fundings, is to have the right partner. And so if you're with Cultivation Capital and you know, Cliff and his team, they're going to come in. And again, they're looking at not just their investment at that time, but the business going forward, as you guys are going to be going to be partners. And to have that advice, you know, essentially what Cliff just laid out, and, and he you know, makes a key point at the end that's going to vary depending on the business, but what he just laid out is unbelievably valuable information for a company to have if that's you know their first time at it sort of raising capital. 
to have that sort of, you know, advice and background and sort of expertise to look to and also trust him. You know, that, that is something where he's not looking at the advantages. He's looking for you know, a successful next sort of step. And so I think that's, you know, just can't speak to the volume of, of, of how valuable that type of sort of relationship is. And it also goes to, you know, there's other ways that funds can be valuable. And, you know, Cliff, I, I you know, this is not on our, our list of discussion points, but, you know, you and you guys, you're, the fund that you work with um, specializes in, in this area and has expertise. And so they are your partners. They will, you know, they will have a board seat. They will sit on the board. They can provide not just, and I think what Cliff just gave is a, is a great example of sort of pre-investment type advice, just being a good partner. But then also, you know, there's post-investment advice and post-investment you know, synergies and strategies and, and collaboration, you know, that a fund such as Cliff's and Cliff and his team, you know, individually they were going to be invaluable and um and so cliff i think again this was not on our list of, of topics but you know if you had any sort of thoughts as to how you know, how you guys partner how you sort of interact with the company post post sort of closing of the investment we'd love to hear about it sure um so for seed stage companies we usually take a board observer seat um you know we're not um you know, we want to be careful not to uh, expect a level of influence that is not uh, in line with the amount of capital that we're investing. So we want to respect that. Um, on our A-Round fund, we take a board seat in every company that we invest in. Uh, we're very active. And so, you know, every company that means something different. Um, there are some that, you know, we're texting back and forth every week. And it's a very casual relationship. And I love that. Actually, that's my favorite kind. But others are more formal uh, because that's how the entrepreneur likes to work and that's how they're comfortable. And, and it tends to be more scheduled meetings and, um, you know, hey, you know, scheduling a time to have a phone call. And that's fine too, right? So personally, I prefer the more casual interaction and, you know, just send me a text or shoot me an email or call whenever something comes to mind. But, um, you know, I'm really here to adapt to the working style. Uh, that works for the given entrepreneur and every company has a different culture. So uh, I'd say that the, the, the key is to be flexible and to provide the kind of support that that individual company needs. And it's, it's not one size fits all, you know, every environment is different. Every person is different. And, you know, our, our, our job is to, is to help them succeed. Ted, I think in this range, sort of flexibility is key. And, uh, and you know, hearing that sort of the, the style of the company because it's, it's inevitably going to vary you know, from one party to another. And so, so seeing a fund kind of adapt to that style is, you know, again, not to overuse the word, but that's, that's value right there. And uh, I think, you know, Cliff and his firm do a great job of it. So we've got another uh, question in from Tom. I'll just read the question and give Cliff a second to sort of digest. If, if we have a SaaS product built to a solid MVP from an engineering perspective, uh, or survive, but need capital for marketing, is it worth discussing pre revenue valuation for funding, or is it generally better for it to focus on, you know, what he's terming as guerrilla marketing to establish revenue before even considering raising capital? Well, I guess let me uh, talk about the, um, I'll talk both sides of the coin. I wish there was a simple answer. It's about, it's about uh, trade-offs. Right. So um, there's no doubt that there are fewer, um, there are fewer funding options for pre-revenue companies than post-revenue companies. So one general rule of thumb is if you can postpone funding uh, or find, you know, postpone the fundraising process later into being post-revenue uh, and, and then as far post-revenue as you can afford, then you're going to find that there's going to be more prospective investors and you're going to have a more productive fundraising process. Um, that's not to say that there aren't people that invest pre-revenue. There are. Uh, particularly, there's a lot of accelerators that focus, that, that love pro uh, companies that have mature product but are pre-market. So I'd say that I would definitely look at accelerators as, as, a, as a good source of the right kind of investor mindset. So as one principle, post-revenue, you're gonna find it easy to raise capital. 
I'm going to throw another principle at you that, that might be a little bit in conflict. And that is you also want to watch your clock because uh, entrepreneur, or investors, VCs want to see high growth. And so pretty much the point from when the product is ready for market, uh, your clock is ticking and they want to see consistent high growth, you know, going forward. So there is pressure to generate revenue and, and, and to grow that revenue. Now, nice thing is when you're starting at zero, you can have spectacular month over month, quarter over quarter performance for, you know, a year with relatively modest increases, right? But that's going to get harder and harder as tens of thousands of revenue turns into hundreds of thousands of revenue and, and, and being able to double or triple that is gonna, is gonna need capital. So I would probably say is try to straddle both concepts, which is um, push on, on the low hanging fruit revenue that you can, that does not require a lot of resources, quote your guerrilla marketing. Um, and I would look at pre-revenue um, uh, funders like accelerators but um, would, would probably, I would see how far you can get into your guerrilla marketing, how effective can that be in a short period of time? And, and if it can be, then, then maybe I would wait. If you can uh, do some guerrilla marketing and, and, and even get you know, $100,000 in revenue, as so long as you can do it in a reasonable period of time, you know, within uh, six months, then I, I might say it'd be worth pushing off a, a serious fundraise effort. Now, if you think that's not possible, uh, that you, you just can't proceed without revenue, that uh, uh, the grill marketing won't deliver significant revenue in a, in a short period of time, then maybe you need to focus on, on fundraising and just recognizing it's gonna be hard. Yeah, that's, that's great advice as well. Um, all right, so we got another question in from Bart. I wanna focus on these because they're more specific and they're helpful. Um, Insulin is a healthcare marketplace company that has revenue. <laughs> Do we pass either your health tech or software IT filters? I'm gonna go ahead and, and couch this one a little bit for Cliff. I, I don't think he can give a you know, direct response um, to the question on, on the line. I think he, he would have to kind of have a private conversation with you and, and look into it. But um, you know, I, I'll answer this: that when when we have deals that are in the healthcare industry, our our software IT um, team will look at those opportunities, but we will get opinions from our healthcare team. So they're, they're our industry experts. So the answer is we'd probably, I'd pull a colleague from our healthcare team to look at it as well. And, and of course, you know, we've got sort of general revenue hurdles. So with revenue, you know, I, it, uh, we, we might view it as a seed deal if it were in the kind of $500,000 range, or we might view it as an A deal if it's in the sort of million dollar range. And I think that also kind of highlights you know, another sort of strength of, of your firm is you know, these kind of additional industries to, to pull from. And you know, we as a law firm, you know, we have a, you know, we're, our corporate group is focused on technology and, and software transactions. And then we have a healthcare team that you know, primarily works on health tech, you know, software companies in, in the healthcare arena, but they also you know, go a little bit above and beyond that and so, Cliff, I think that's a you know, you know, just a, a huge sort of advantage to, to working with you guys. And, and Bart sort of teed it up you know, exactly that you would, you would, you know, sort of synergize across the, the various um, portfolios. We really believe in specialization and the value that it brings. I think it helps us when you know your industry better. You're going to make better portfolio selections, and you're just going to bring more value, better value to those companies. And I find that. Also being a specialist helps you win the most competitive deals. And so uh, I think it makes uh, the firm more attractive to entrepreneurs when we can you know, have a board member who really knows that space. Well, great. And then, you know, just kind of, you know, pull thing, everything together, you know, we're, we're all sort of Southeastern based here. Um, you know, the, a lot of the folks on the, on the line are, Atlanta companies that might have folks working, you know, remotely might have, you know, data centers elsewhere. Have you, have you seen any, any trends, you know, as, in particular post COVID as to you know, sort of where physically where the, the workforce of a company might be and whether or not that would have any impact on your decision as investors? 
Uh, yes. It, well, the whole geography question is really interesting. So um, uh, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, for the record. Um, we, um, before COVID, uh, co-located teams that office together, earn, uh, the companies that were, that were co-located earned a premium over companies that had distributed workforces. Uh, acquirers, not, not necessarily because venture capital companies cared, but acquirers liked acquiring the traditional concept of an office and a team and the culture or everybody's in one place. They felt like they could get their hands around it, right? They understood and they knew what they were buying, right? It was very physical, all very right there. They could see everybody. Uh, and, and, and because of that, um, co-located teams earned a premium. And so generally speaking, before COVID, again, before COVID, we would um, uh, suggest to companies that they try first to hire teams in their home market, in their home office, wherever it might be. Uh, and then if they cannot get the team they need, then to fall back on remote workers. And, and as a result, we'd see companies that might be two thirds co-located, one third distributed, something like that. Uh, and, and, and sort of maintain the brand as being a co-located company that has distributed workers. Now, I feel like it's a little bit all out the window. And, and at least at this moment, I don't think there's that same bias against distributed teams. Um, there's a, a tremendous acceptance of distributed teams. Now. I also want to make sure to emphasize right now, because we've been through this before. Um, back in the late 90s, there was a huge distributed work um, craze, and companies were closing offices and pushing people, and hot desks were the hot thing, and, uh, and, and they ended up all coming back. And so we have had in recent history, relatively recent history, uh, uh, the market seemed to go really hard at distributed teams and then snapped back like a rubber band, more decade, dedicated to co-located than ever before, all within about a 10 year period. So I, I wouldn't rule it out that in five years, 10 years, being co-located could be back in fashion because we just tend to have a pendulum in all shifts and trends and it swings one way and it swings the other. I think right now we're swung about as far as we're gonna to get to acceptance of distributed teams. I do think that might swing back. I think there's a better than 50% chance it'll swing back. And you know, 10 years might sound like a long time away, but that might be in the lifetime of you owning your company. And so I would still, as a safety precaution, uh, say that if you can co-locate, you should, but don't hold your company back trying to achieve that you know hire the best people you can but when given a choice try to cluster them and 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 just sort of play you know spread out your bet a little bit the best you can but um right now i don't think there's any discrimination against distributed teams but uh, i really leave that open to changing uh you know sometime over five years ten years in the future yeah and i'm glad we had this discussion because it's such a pertinent time for this exact discussion. If you look at it, we'll see, you know, companies, they you kind of think if you're talking to investors where, you know, what Cliff say is traditionally, it'd be better to have everyone in one location. Maybe that's changing. We'll see what happens going forward. But then if you're trying to attract employees, it's a different, you know, maybe a different story. We'll hear companies kind of, you know, say oh, our, you know, our folks are 75% here, 10% here, the other 15% are, are here. But we all are able to work from home. And they, they highlight that they're, and they're proud of it because they did, and the HR teams put in a lot of work to, to make that a, you know, a reality. And I think with a, you know, across industry, what we've learned is, or what, you know, in particular, a lot of companies have learned is, A, we can do this. It is feasible. You know, we always kind of look at our business as a, you know, the first place that I looked to, but then the, you know, our law firm proved that we can, we can be remote. We, we learned that immediately. We never really had much concerns over it. I mean, we're, we had the technology already in place. I think most you know, law firms do. And so we were me immediately able to go out and sort of, you know, become remote. Uh, now we're learning, now we're saying, okay, we can do it, but is that better or worse? And we don't, I don't think we know the answer to the question. And, and you know, the answer is going to be, we're going to look back and we're going to get statistics on employee retention. 
Yep. And we're going to come, I think right now though, is not a normal time. So kind of when the COVID things get back to normal, which I think we're close to that, keep thinking we're uh, thinking that we're close to that, but someday they will be, yep. and it won't be that far away. And when it gets back to normal, they're going to do studies and they're going to study retention on distributed employees and co-located employees. And we'll get the answer. And, and if there is, uh, if it's found that, that one method over the other has significantly better employee retention stats, it's gonna, that's the, the method that's gonna be in favor. And you know, I've heard people argue that, that being distributed might have higher retention because employees like working from home and they can, um, gives them uh, more flexibility. But I think that there's a double-edged sword that it also makes it super easy to, to job hop and to leave companies and join another. I suspect we're gonna find that co-located employees have better job retention, but we'll see. And I think when that data starts becoming very clear and publicized, then the bias in the market is gonna evolve. Yep. We're gonna start seeing you know, commercial real estate firms pump out their sort of studies on what companies are doing. And, and I think you know, your, your prediction is probably gonna be right. But you know, point. for us, early stage company, your first job is to survive. So I wouldn't worry about optimizing if you're not even thriving. And so first and foremost, get the team you need to execute. Then we'll worry about optimizing. Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe that's, a, that's sort of a great way to pull this together is to you know, focus on you know, what's important. And Cliff has done a, a great job throughout this entire program of sort of saying, hey, here, you know, look to trade secrets, look, you know, look to sort of, you know, is I is intellectual property you know something that that's a, that important to your business? And a number of different you know kind of items that I look at as you know, let's you know goose for the gander type type concept. And um and and Cliff has also done a, a great job of of you know sort of showcasing the strengths of, of their fund. And I, I think cultivation capital is you know right sort of in the wheelhouse for a number of the companies sitting on the lines today you know, at ATDC or, or elsewhere you know, here in, you know, in the Southeast. And again, Cliff notes, he, he's in Greenville, very, you know, two hours away. We, we travel up there a, a good bit. We have a number of clients there. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's interesting to hear more about, about cultivation capital. And, and really, as we're going through this conversation, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, just how valuable of a partner you know, they are and, and, and will be, and, and, um, and hopefully this will turn up some discussions with some of the companies on the line. But Cliff, if I uh, wanted to give you a few party words, there's anything you know, I skipped over or any kind of you know, items that you wanted to sort of address as we uh, finish up here? Uh, no, but uh, you know, definitely um, you know, happy to uh, help. I'm a big fan of uh, ATDC. It's an organization we would definitely like to uh, do more to support. So uh, looking forward to growing that relationship. Um, yeah, I, I'm only uh, uh, two hours away. Uh, we have a colleague um, in Atlanta uh, who's there all the time. And so um, we definitely, it's an important market for us, one that we're uh, um, been very uh, purposeful about wanting to get more involved in and uh, looking forward to doing that. Well, thank you very much, Cliff. Larkin, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great conversation. I would like to ask one question. Um, if uh, our viewers wanted uh, possibly to have a conversation, um, what would, how would they reach out to Cliff? They can uh, email me at okay. cholecamp at cultivationcapital.com. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much as always uh, to our sponsor, uh, Morris Manning Martin. Uh, this will end our program uh, for today, and uh, we look forward to the next one uh, in the new year.